Okay, so we, we might start now as um, it is uh, already a few minutes past our, our due time. So thank you everyone and welcome to this uh, new Oakland Institute webinar on uh, driving dispossession, the global push to unlock the economic potential of land. Before we start, some uh, quick logistic details. The, the webinar will go for 90 minutes. There will be some time for questions after the panelists have presented. You may write your questions at any time if you're on Zoom in the Q&A box. And uh, if you're on Facebook, you just write your comment in the, your question in the, in the comment section. Also, please know that a recording will be made available on our website and Facebook page afterwards. The webinar will be also broadcasted tomorrow, 8 a.m. Pacific time on KPFA radio in the uh, Rude Awakening uh, program, the essential program on the climate emergency by Sabrina Jacobs, tomorrow, 8 a.m. Pacific time. We are uh, on the we on the uh, so I'm, I'm told there's a the, we are supposed to be on Facebook Live. I'm told the there's a there's a problem on our Facebook. So uh, I'll try to address that in a second. So, sorry about that. Um, so well, hopefully we can uh, we can uh, play the video on Facebook uh, in a, with a little uh, delay. Um, so we on the on the west coast of the U.S. we've been in the midst of record heat waves and gigantic wildfires for several weeks now. Over two million hectares, thousands of houses have burned, uh, dozens of people have died. Air quality has been toxic for weeks for millions of people here. And uh, I, I have the regret to announce that uh, Michael Fakri, the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food, had to cancel his participation to the event today because the fires got very close to his uh, home in uh, Oregon, which is north from, uh, from the California state. And, uh, and it, it just, uh, he was just unable to, to join us today. So, we wish him and his family well, hoping things will be better soon in, uh, in Oregon and we'll have another opportunity to, to speak with him. But we'll have uh, with us, as you can see on your screen, Anuka Vimutki from the Movement for Land and Agricultural Reform, Manla in Sri Lanka, Jason Gelbord, founder and executive director of Upland Advisors, working in Myanmar, and Pamela Avusi from Forset in uh, Papua New Guinea, who it's a middle of the night for, for her, so we did a recording of her presentation, but she's, uh, she's uh, following the, the, the webinar and may be available for the, the Q&A at the end. So the, the fires affecting the US, like Brazil, Australia earlier this year, Indonesia before, make it clear that we are really dealing with a global issue. The effects of climate change cannot be more obvious than it is these, uh, these days here on the West Coast. And as shown in our latest report, Driving Dispossession, what is global is also that governments around the world, instead of addressing the climate emergency and uh, associated environmental degradation and deforestation, these governments are doubling down so more land and natural resources can be exploited. The report we published in July sounds the alarm on this really unprecedented wave of land privatization that is underway around the world. There are myriad of ways 
by which governments willingly or under the pressure of financial, financial institutions or so-called donors are putting more land into so-called productive use in the name of development. The report features six case studies and we are going to focus on three of them today with our speakers, Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Papua New Guinea. Uh, to, to start with Sri Lanka, the, the Millennium Challenge Corporation is a US government entity that has offered the country a grant for a land project with a stated objective of promoting land transactions that could stimulate, uh, I'm quoting, uh, that could stimulate investment and increase its use as an economic asset. The compact aims to improve access to land for the private sector. The plan is to register and digitize land records to cover 67% of all land in the country, 67%. While the government is still to make a final decision uh, into accept, accepting or not this, uh, or shall we say, uh, poison gift, uh, civil society in Sri Lanka strongly rejects the deal. So joining us now, we have Anuka Vitmutki from the Movement for Land and Agricultural Reform, MONLA, in Sri Lanka. MONLA is a non-profit uh, voluntary organization who campaigns against adverse effects of globalization and working on people initiated sustainable development alternatives in Sri Lanka. Anuka is also a member of the International Coordination Committee of La Via Campesina. Welcome, Anuka, and thank you so much for joining us today, especially at uh, this less, less time for you. Anuka, could you please share with us what are your concerns around this MCC compact and on recent attempts to privatize land in Sri Lanka? Anuka? Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon for everyone. Uh, today, uh, I'm glad to participate here as a panelist with the uh, Auckland University uh, Research Institute and uh, I'm going to explain what happened to the with the MCC compact in Sri Lanka. Mainly I'm, I'm firstly explain about the, my concern about the compact. Uh, Sri Lanka uh, economic problem were long in making uh, to rapid neoliberalizations of the economic and society and the uh, mounting national debt. Uh, particularly within the last decade. Totally public debt in the 2020 amount, Sri Lankan rupees 14.1 trillion. China is emerged as a largest lender in Sri Lanka and this debt amount is stood uh, American dollar billion 15 2018. And uh, yearly due to the foreign debt in the payment of Sri Lanka, stood at uh, American dollars uh, billion 4.8 in last December. The government is in the big finance crisis, uh, no money to run country now. Uh, in this contest, uh, uh, MCC grant uh, trying to give, uh, looking, uh, applying for the several key politicians in the government in uh, in the early 2020 short inclusions inside the MCC on this ground. Now they are offering uh, 480 billion American dollar for the Sri Lankan government. In the April 2019 in Sri Lanka was granted US 480 billion under the MCC compact. The proposed provision of the compact including two types of project, especially the digitalization land holding in the selected district and the modernization improving transport. Uh, this project uh, give 67 billion land project has an estimate economic rate of return to return of to 26 percent improve the explain improve the ability for the land right information. But uh, we believe MCC compact is threat to the people's sovereignty, people's right and land and earth-based uh, resources. Uh, MCC is slowly representing the geopolitics and economic interest of the US and is the instrument of the new type imperialism, pressure, economic hegemony over developing countries. Sri Lanka in the very good geopolitical location and the US 
government has hidden agenda with the using the geolocation uh, because uh, uh, we are in middle of the Indian Ocean mainly they can easily control Asian po Asian politics and economic situation therefore MCC part of the US Indo-Pacific policy in the context MCC should be read the evaluate together with the Accession uh, cross service agreement and the purpose steps of the uh, force agreement. Signing MCC will ensure the Sri Lanka costly uh, geopolitical conflict between US and China. In the old cases, my concern about the compact is mainly focused on its impact on the land right and national security. And also, I'm trying to say uh, mainly this uh, MCC uh, trying to give to the uh, land title for the people. Uh, I like to I like to mention that point also. According to the national statistics, 27 percent of Sri Lanka workforce in engage in agriculture. The government own more more than 80 percent of land in Sri Lanka, including the land few with small percent cultivate without land deed. Uh, the land uh, development ordinance in, of uh, 1935 prohibited to sale and mortgage this land distributed by permit and grant, but children can inherit it. The proposed MCC compact will provide land title and uh, individuals. It will be also make the land transfer easy. Uh, this compact will be remove the ex uh, existing uh, legal limit of land equation and land consideration of, of a 50 acres limit for private land ownership. Though this compact, US, it's trying to clear such hurdle of commercial agriculture and land, land scale, uh, large scale equation of Sri Lanka, land of foreign individual and corporation. Government due to uh, going to implement the new land special uh, provisions act the concept of the digitalization land and granting deed and attempting take uh, take away land ownership of the people this is the two point i have to mention and can we go with more how civil civil society um, oppress the MCC compact, uh, civil society said uh, we are totally oppressed the MCC compact. They are saying this land reform not for the people, this MCC agreement uh, have not addressed the real issue relating the land in Sri Lanka. The agreement will not address in the need of women, marginalized people, or affected people and also low income communities. Uh, patriarchal land ownership and also the access to land and uh, use and protection the uh, for protection for the future. The farmer government has stopped the signing MCC because of the pressure pressure created by the civil society and all them also demand the MCC become a hot topic in last presidential election. And the current government took the uh, positive out, output of it. The former government put uh, up the cabinet paper on MCC and have been unable to short out it. The uh, four member of cabinet committee proclaimed the agreement and unsafe to uh, this MCC is unsafe to the country sovereignty. Uh, as a civil society we said we firmly we strongly opposition the uh, proposal of the of MCC compact as it is clearly inimical to the economic sovereignty of Sri Lanka. Injured, in, engineered to promote promote communal and distract for for the real danger of the MCC project. Propose the right and asset of the peoples of Sri Lanka country to propose objective implementation and MCC program would result in the accelerating poverty and inequalities by deposition the poor. Project for the uh, poverty aviation through the growth 
should interest in the education and health care focus on the creating decent job for living wages ensure the people right to land water and clean air should not conform to the market industrial development must be environmentally sustainable for the promote small producer agriculture and fisheries the government of sri lanka should not sign the mcc this is our main uh, opposition as a civil society and also uh, as a small holder farmers uh, they have a special demand against to the mcc they said uh, as a farm uh, marginalized uh, communities they need policy support and measure to the strong local market for their product we need policy support and people friendly legislation and uh, public inter uh, investment agriculture to protect the small farmers and also we demand public policy to build the, upon the principle of agrarian uh, agrarian and food sovereignty any agreement has to empower to poor and protect the sovereignty of the country its people we we call land is life our constitution clearly enhances the land and the resources belong to the people and for the future the government only uh, concern about the custodian of the land and resources we do not want to any aids to define present rights and land of the peoples right food sovereignty we will not remain silent to our struggle continue against the government and corporation and uh, and i have a special special many points like professor for the mcc also recorded uh, continuation of the development policies uh, patriarchal but uh, particularly reason to the agrarian and land pressure of the sri lankan government under the guardian of the world bank project in 1990 uh, this is also one special point how the international agencies handling the sri lankan uh, land uh, in here and also the neoliberal policy since the long time another reason why the sri lankan government is the tight to position unable to the measure and take solid opposition stain against to the mcc compact thank you this is my explanation yeah thank you so much anuka it was a it was a great presentation and uh, uh, i i really uh, i really appreciate also how you you explained that so far the government hasn't signed the compact under the pressure of civil society and it's uh, it's very encouraging to see the, the the power we all have in in really standing in the way of this uh, of, of these plans by governments and corporations and international institutions such as the world bank uh, something particularly striking about the mcc deal in sri lanka is that we have as you explained a country in a dire economic situation and then there's a u.s government entity coming really with a poison gifts we the, the the us is offering 500 million as a grant but part of this grant is to uh, is like 67 million out of 500 is to uh, launch the privatization of the land and the creation of a land market so thank you again anuka uh, please feel free uh, i know some people have already started putting some questions in the q a please feel free to add more we'll uh, address them towards the end after all the panelists have spoken and we are now moving to myanmar we've heard a lot in recent years about the rohingya refugee crisis and the horrific situation in refugee camps we have not heard as much about the land issues underlying the crisis and affecting the rohingyas as well as uh, many other indigenous communities in the country in 2018, the vacant fallow and virgin land law, known as a VFV law, was amended to boost economic development by making so-called vacant lands available for agriculture, mining, and other purposes. Joining us now is Jason Gelbot, founder and executive director of Upland Advisors. Upland Advisors is a nonprofit organization that supports 
sustainable peace building initiatives by providing trusted advice on strategy, policy, and law related matters to ethnic stakeholders in Myanmar. Jason, thanks so much for being with us today. And uh, just could you please, it's a, it's, a complex, uh, it's a complex situation in Myanmar. Could you please explain to us the situation and the threats, legal and others, to the land rights and livelihoods of ethnic minorities in Myanmar? Yes, uh, thank you so much um, to Oakland Institute for organizing this and um, everyone for joining today. Um, I am going to uh, share a PowerPoint presentation, so please bear with me for a moment. Um, hopefully you can see this now. Um, let me know if it isn't working for you all. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll be talking about the land law reforms in uh, Myanmar over recent years and how they've affected uh, people on the ground there. Um, the driving dispossession report provides an excellent overview of the vacant fallow and virgin land management law amendments. Um, I'll refer to that as the VFP law for short. Uh, I also encourage everyone to read a recent blog post um, on the Oakland Institute website that discusses two other recent legislative reforms that are also very important. Uh, Myanmar's legal system and recent law reforms facilitate the seizure of land, especially from ethnic minorities who have their own customary and traditional land uses. This in turn increases the risk of armed conflict and severe economic inequality. Many ethnic communities feel that government land laws are being used to continue systems of oppression against them by law and administration as an extension of years of active warfare. Uh, I will discuss a little bit of background about the country, then describe the land law reforms and discuss a little bit of some implications and resistance uh, to these laws and the harms that they've caused. In terms of background, I wanna briefly mention the high level of diversity in the country, the importance of customary land use and the prevalence of armed conflict. Um, I know it's difficult to see uh, this map um, and I'm not sure uh, if it's visible on uh, both of the streaming services um, but this is a map of the main spoken languages uh, in the country. Um, you can see there's a lot of different colors all mixed together. Um, and the yellow is the, where the majority Mima or Burmese language is predominantly spoken. Of course, within each of these colored areas, there's lots of different languages spoken as well. Um, language is not the same as ethnicity, but this generally reflects the ethnic composition of the country as well. Um, and agriculture is incredibly important in the country. It's the majority employer. And in the areas um, around the, you know, the non-yellow parts of this country, of the, the map, uh, customary land use is incredibly uh, important, including different forms of highland agriculture, collective ownership, um, and issues related to forests and waterways. Many of these issues uh, that relate to land and land seizures affect the entire country but there are particular harms in the areas where, where there's customary use and where there's armed conflict. There's been over 70 years of civil wars where the central government has been fighting against ethnic-based resistance movements in many of these multicolored regions um, and also have been particularly targeting civilians, um, as was mentioned with the Rohingya and also other groups in uh, these other parts of the country, the Shan, Kachin, Karen, Kareni, uh, Rakhine, others. Um, the majority of highly valuable natural resources are in uh, these ethnic minority areas um, and are being targeted for exploitation by military linked businesses. As um, a number of ceasefires have been reached in recent decades, the most frequently documented human rights complaints after those ceasefires has been land grabbing. So I want to move on to discussing recent uh, land law reforms. It's uh, important to acknowledge the 2008 current constitution. Uh, this was drafted by the military regime. The constitution provides for all land and natural resources to be owned by the union and powers over land issues are highly centralized and controlled uh, at the central level. The first uh, parliament and government under this constitution was dominated by the military's uh, proxy political party. They passed um, three uh, 
important land laws and also other um, land related uh, legislation. Um, and they started a process for a national land use policy, which was intended to direct future lawmaking. Um, however, this land use policy still has not been properly implemented um, four or five years later. Um, I'm going to focus more on what's happened. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. There's a request to, to put your PowerPoint in a slideshow mode so people can see it better. I don't, I don't have the, I don't master Zoom enough, but if you know how to do that, uh, the, the audience is requesting that to, to make it easier to read the slideshow mode. Okay, my apologies. I, I thought it's it was visible on Zoom. Game. Thank you. No worry, we all uh, we all uh, learning all these technologies, and um, I mean I can read well from uh, from uh, on my screen, but I guess people okay. Let me know if this isn't better. visible now. That looks much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for the for the intervention to make it easier to see. Um, so under the current uh, administration. Um, since the since Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy Party uh, won in a landslide election uh, in 2015, um, there have been amendments or updates to each of the three major land laws. Uh, as Frederick mentioned, uh, the VFE law was amended in 2018, uh, and this is discussed in uh, in the report. So uh, something important about this law is that um, it affects a huge amount of the country, over 45 million acres. Um, and uh, the, this amendment creates a new six month deadline requiring people to apply to register any land classified by the state as VFE land or else they face criminal penalties. Um, the penalties are a two year prison term and or a fine of over $300. So how would this affect you if you've been using your ancestral land uh, and you learn that you are now supposed to apply for a permit, you have a choice. Uh, if you apply for and manage to receive uh, this permit, the permit only grants you a 30 year usage right. So then you are giving up all your other ownership claims. Or you could choose not to apply, in which case there's a risk you will face a two year prison sentence and or a fine and a company might possibly apply for the permit and kick you off your land and you will completely lose your land. Uh, I should note that the amendment does include an exclusion for customary land. However, Myanmar law lacks a clear definition of customary land. So a person who wants to assert that their land is excluded because it is customary is gambling that now or in the future, the legal system will agree with them that their land should be excluded and they are do not have any guarantee that they will still not lose their land or end up in prison at some point. Uh, the graphic on this slide is part of a campaign against the VFE amendment uh, that was developed by the Land in Our Hands Civil Society Network, uh, and it was produced in all different languages that are used in the country. Um, the two other laws um, that were amended or passed newly uh, this year and last year are the Farmland Act and the land acquisition resettlement and rehabilitation law. Uh, and these similarly create new criminal offenses. There are farmers currently serving prison sentences under the Farmland Act. And uh, they also uh, actually weaken uh, customary land tenure further uh, by uh, basically making people who, who might use certain types of customary tenure instead have to assert rights under existing uh, state recognized uh, land ownership. Um, I want to move on, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions about uh, these laws later. Um, there have been a lot of land grabs throughout the history of the country, um, and there's a long standing and continued pattern of persecution and oppression against uh, people who try to oppose their land being grabbed. Um, this happens not only under these laws, but also under other types of laws that deal with trespass, protesting, uh, protection of public property and, and other uh, charges. Uh, this is a screenshot of a recent um, news story from mid-August 
the headline is Burma Army prosecutes more than 20 Sise farmers for trespassing on their own land. Uh, this is just one of many recent and ongoing cases. Um, in this case, in the 1990s, following a ceasefire agreement um, with a local resistance organization, uh, military units and the military's business holding company seized over 2,000 acres of land in the area. Most of this land was never utilized. Farmers continued to farm the land. Many probably never realized that there was a claim made to their land and no compensation was ever paid. And then this past May, uh, soldiers from two infantry battalions forcibly seized um, a lot of land and charged farmers who had been working that land for a uh, very long time with trespassing on that same land. Um, civil society organizations have called for the land to be returned and for the government to respect traditional land use. The farmers say they will continue to farm the land. The government says this is impossible. Uh, there's been already uh, a, at least one court hearing and the case is ongoing. As I mentioned, this is only one of many cases. At the end of this August, the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners has documented 199 farmers in the country awaiting trial. 12 of them are in detention. Eight others are serving prison sentences. Earlier this year, 41 farmers and activists uh, had been released from prison in Kareni State uh, due to one case where they had been convicted for protesting against their land being seized by the military. Uh, and I want to show this, uh, these images, um, which are also from uh, that same part of the country um, where people were protesting against the VFE law amendments uh, in 2019. And their slogans um, here are, there is no vacant fallow and virgin land in our Kareni state and respect the right of indigenous people. We are indigenous people. This land is our land. So I'll just quickly end by mentioning um, I think three implications, um, although there, there are, of course, others as well, um, of these land law reforms. Uh, these land law reforms are mainly regressive. They facilitate land grabbing by the military and businesses. The laws add criminal penalties that can be used against villagers simply for living on and using their land. In combination, these land laws can be used to seize customary land or weaken customary land claims the state legal system still fails to protect customary and collective land use. Only community-based systems and some ethnic-based land administrations currently properly recognize customary and collective tenure. And then about armed conflict. Many people in civil society and ethnic communities view these land laws as tools for the state to extend its control over ethnic territories and peoples. There's a large risk that this will create greater conflict. Legislative reforms also contradict elements of existing ceasefire agreements and peace talk agendas, making future conflict resolution far more challenging. In addition, there's untold numbers of refugees and IDPs inside and outside the country who likely are losing their land of origin or access to alternative sites, making return and resettlement incredibly difficult. Again, thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Jason. It was, uh, it was again so so interesting, and um, and thanks for the work you you're doing. It's uh, you know you can see I mean, it is really shocking to see the kind of law the government of Myanmar is passing to dispose of people, but also how it goes along with uh, with really a criminal a criminalization of farmers and whoever stands in the way of this uh, takeover of land by the the military and businesses. But again. Uh, uh, as for what Anuka showed us, as is the case of Sri Lanka, and even under such a uh, military regime, it is also so encouraging to, to see how the, the civil society is really standing in the way and opposing these laws and, and really telling these generals that this is not right and we, we can't allow this. So, uh, I feel uh, a lot of hope uh, knowing the, the violence that has been happening in this country to see the people's resistance to this, uh, to this trend. Thank you again, Jason. We are now going to hear from, uh, from Pamela Avusi, who is a leading advocate for land rights in Papua New Guinea. Pamela works with Forset, a local nonprofit company that supports local communities in uh, sustainable forest management. In Papua New Guinea, 
97% of the land is governed by customary uh, land laws, customary tenure system. Uh, but there is a government plan, so-called development plan, uh, to privatize 20% of this land by 2022. So just next few years. The government says, he, and I'm quoting, he wants to unlock this land so it can be mobilized and put into productive use. I have all these quotation marks, uh, and again, some for to ensure private sector growth. Unfortunately, due to the, the time difference, we had to record Pamela's presentation in advance of the webinar. But she she is uh, she is up. It's two is three in the morning in Papua New Guinea. But she is up and hopefully will be able to participate to the to the Q and A. So we've asked Pamela to explain to us the importance of customary land tenure in her country and how the system is being threatened today and what is her view on what the government should be doing as an alternative to current development plan. So let's uh, let's hear Pamela Abusi's perspective on that. I'm going to play the, the video now. In Papua New Guinea, customary land is very important. And nine, about 90% of the land belongs to the customary land owner. And if it nurtures and it gives us this life, it is, um, in our country, we treat it as, as it is our identity and sovereignty. Therefore, we as custodians of the land, do not do not like own the land, but the land owns us. That that's what we should have in mind. So the land needed us. And in the Melanesian society, the land is held under a collective um, collective terms. So it belongs to the clan that lives on that land, and the decision is made by the clans on how they want to use the land. Therefore. Um, one of the biggest land issues affected, affecting um, the, the people of um, the people of this country and is of great concern for the country now is the government's drive for um, land registration and um, incorporated land groups. And this is often combined with the um, promotion of voluntary customer land registration after a success, successful of uh, ILG registration. And uh, ILG or incorporated land group is an organized clan group legally given recognition to the to become a corporate entity under the ILG Act. However, the current trends um, have shown that ILGs have largely been used as a shortcut to obtain landowner consent for resource exploitation. The ILG mechanism has been widely misused to detriment of um, those landowners who have been excluded and are not part of of a party to, to the benefit distribution. Once the ILG is registered, it becomes a free of land, and the land is, and the land now belongs to the ILG and not the individual clan before or prior to um, registering the ILG. The misuse of the misuse of the ILGs and the misuse of um, registering land this is in the country leads to land grabbing now, and one of the, one of these. Uh, Big factor, a big drive or drive for land registration and forming ILGs is the issue of um, special agriculture businesses, which has been prolonging and it, it has been going on for this country for about 10 years now. And this, this concept of a special agriculture business list has grabbed about 10% of the customer land. So we which um, now shows that the 97% of the customary land which are owned by the people has decreased in the last 10 years through the SABL scheme, a special agriculture business list. And SABL is a system where the customary land can be freed up for agriculture development, obviously, whether the, the development benefits the people or not, this is another question. But it is driven by the lands department within this country with the consent of customary landowners as per the act. However, this, this process has been manipulated over time and there are loopholes in, in the process of acquiring um, land for special agriculture businesses. 
Last year, another, another new land scheme that, that was, was introduced uh, by the land department that, that sparked another um, system or another method of land grab is the, the National Land Summit. And um, if, we, if we really look at it, the National Land Summit itself, it is, to, it is to benefit the interests of the multinational companies, the commercial banks, the foreign governments, that all exercise based on the first premise of one, freeing up customer land for development. Or, or in other words, sometimes the land department say the customer land is unutilized and it, it is a barrier to development. So they came up with this new scheme. But uh, according to a report that was um, released by Ethno last year, the truth is that um, the customary land, land already provides employment for 3 million farmers and sub people of this country. And it supported an economy which is worth about 40 billion a year, as per Ethna report. Rather than trying to mobilize the customary land for taking it away from the people, the government should be mobilizing the rural people, encourage people's development, make people develop their own land, assist with, with um, the existing agriculture uh, techniques in place or horticulture techniques in place, assist people to enter into business and use their own land and go into small and medium enterprises or industries. This is, this is exactly the, the development part that is uh, um, laid out in our constitution too. So the government should be defending our customer land honesty employing like extensive services that will help increase the productivity and improve access to the market. It should not be encouraging selling of land or leasing of land to corporations or leasing of land to out, outside people. We should be looking at how we develop, we develop our people's mindset, how we develop, um, assist our people to develop their own land and make money for themselves, it is new land land summit scheme. It tells us that um, it, it definitely tells us that we cannot trust our we cannot trust our government now to administer uh, customer land. Even they can't administer three percent of the state land. So what makes us as Papua New Guineans to trust the government to administer our customer land? Yeah, with my experience, when the narrative of um, Privatizing land is mentioned. It does. It, it is. It is something that will lure our land owners to free of customer land in the name of development. Which most times they don't actually benefit from the development, and most times the preference are given to the big corporations to make money on our very own people's land. What we've been working and lobbying with the land department, and we've been very much involved since last year when they started the idea of the national sustainable land use policy is um, using the bottom-up approach. So we've been working that force that we've been working with communities mm -hmm. for a long time in, in terms of uh, sustainable uh, land use planning for the communities, facilitating the process. So this idea can be incorporated into the national sustainable land use plan. And we, we, we try our best to work with them. We, we've given some ideas to them on how these plans can be incorporated with the World Development Plan, given the fact that the most most of the land in this country are customarily owned. They can't do any planning on top of um, land that belongs to someone else, common sense. So they can do they can do the planning on those um, on the three percent state land. The 97% um, customer land is to, is to get more input from the people. So the only way to, to have a successful or have a good uh, uh, national sustainable land use policy is uh, encouraging um, bottom-up approach planning, which includes the custodians of the land, which the people in the village or the people in the rural communities or people on the land. In this way, we will have a good um, land use policy for the country. I, I felt that that is the best way forward we can go. But um, I, I would like to summarize um, my, my points which I mentioned on letting the people take on the process because they own the land. So we, 
the government to encourage this idea of investing in people's development because people's development is the real economy of the country and it will boost the economy of the country which is the economy trend in the country is, is like going down so in in accordance with the economic growth between upon you the, the discussions have always centered in large-scale resource expectations they will drive the economy and then they use the ILCs and the land registries and volunteers Customer land registries and now the national land summit. All these mechanisms, they they they, they think will um they think these mechanisms will facilitate the economic growth of this country, which which they are not looking at the river side of the people on the land and the, the very people that will encourage the growth of the economy in the country is the people that toil the land. Yeah, so there is no mention of what currently drives the PNG's economy today. There is like studies into um, rural livelihoods or subsistence growth over the past decades. So, customary land is highly productive and not going to, to waste as large scale operations have, 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 have led us to believe. It, it, is, it is something that, that, that has grown into a mindset to believe that these big uh, developments will um, boost the economic growth. But it's the output and the impact is neither measured properly not publicly recognized. But um, while having said that, the way forward of um, having, having a good sustainable national sustainable land use plan, our emphasis again is on giving, giving the people every space to contribute to this by encouraging or by using the bottom-up approach. Is any at the end of the day the the people own the land and they have the right to do this and they, they have the right to contribute to the land use policy. Otherwise, the land sustainable national sustainable land use policy idea will kept prolonging and it will go around in circles and we don't know whether we'll achieve it or not. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pamela. I uh, hope you, you're still with us uh, despite the, the late hour. Thank you so much for the, the presentation. Um, it's really, um, it, you, you've said several times in your presentation that people own the land. And in Papua New Guinea, uh, like in many parts of the world, and uh, most of Sub Saharan Africa, and many in Myanmar and Sri Lanka, uh, people do own the land and uh, it's not because they purchased it or, or, or got a, a piece of paper for it. It's, uh, it's uh, what, because, uh, because the ancestors are, are buried there because they, uh, they've been living and working there all their life because they, they know they must preserve the land and the associated natural resources for the generations to, to come. So it's, a, it's definitely not the same kind of ownership that we, we hear of uh, from the governments and institutions who are telling us we need to create land market and to provide titles to the people. It's a, it's a complete um, a different relationship to land where land is like water, like the air we breathe is a, is, is a common good. And uh, and I remember visiting the Ministry of Agriculture in uh, in Madang in Papua New Guinea, where the officials was telling me we need to change people's mindset. We need to we need them to free up land for development, and like like if they were going to do development without with other people. Thank you again for to our three panelists, and apologies again for the absence of uh, Michael Fakri due to the wildfires in Oregon. For those who have missed uh, the beginning of the of the of the webinar, Michael could not join us today. But fortunately, we had these uh, three wonderful panelists we've heard. Uh, the, the the three countries we've looked at today uh, are three countries that we looked at also in our in driving disposition report that was released in July. The, the report 
give some more details on these countries and also uh, provide uh, a very interesting analysis and information on, on a few other countries. I just, uh, before we, we go into the q and I just say a word on those. The, um, also because uh, it, what we are talking about is really global. It's not just the three countries we've talked about, but it's, it's a global trend and, uh, and it's really what we've tried to show in this report. It is really a, a global issue that we need to, to address. So three other countries, Zambia, the World Bank has partnered with a, a subsidiary of the US-based uh, online retailer overstock.com to use blockchain technology for land titling with the goal of quotation marks unlocking trillions of dollars in global mineral reserves that are inaccessible due to unclear land governance system. So we see blockchain in Zambia and many other countries in Africa and around the world as suddenly the, 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 the magic one to, to solve land tenure problems and food security and poverty. Uh, Ukraine, we had a case study on Ukraine where we saw in March, this last March, the government being forced to create a land market for the really the breadbasket of, of Europe, a country with over 30 million hectares of agricultural land, very fertile. The country being forced to, to create a land market for this, uh, for this land before it could receive financial aid from the IMF and the World Bank. So we've documented that. Uh, more details in the report. We have another case study on, on uh, Brazil with Bolsonaro, which have been, uh, we, who has been aggressively expanding ranching and exploitation of the Amazon, as we all know, at the expense of the, the indigenous people and the forest they live in and still are. It's six, six case studies out of uh, many countries around the world with hundreds of millions of hectares of land being made available including from some of the poorest countries. There's a, in the report, there's a very interesting collage where you see one after the other, all the countries who advertise the land, uh, millions of hectares of land available for investors, for ranching, for mining, for uh, logging, uh, and of course, uh, large scale agriculture such as uh, oil palm and others. So this is really what governments are told they should do for development for economic growth they need to attract investors and, and many poor countries have uh, no industry and very rural based economy so they they are offering their land and natural resources for development uh, as showed by our panelists uh, uh, local communities civil society organizations indigenous people are standing up to resist their efforts to these efforts to to privatize the land and this is really an essential struggle to preserve their livelihoods and the, and the planet. They, 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 do, they do this for their own life and, and future, but it is really our struggle of all. So they really need to be supported for, for this struggle. So now, uh, after, so you, you can, you can uh, see, uh, learn more from the, from the report itself, which is available on our website. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to the Q&A as we have already several, um, uh, several questions here. Uh, I don't know if the panelists have seen the, have seen the question, but I will start with one for Anuka, which is about the use of uh, international human rights standards in your work. Uh, do you use this standard, the UN Declaration on the Right of Peasants? the UN basic principles and guidelines on development based on eviction and displacement, the, the different UN uh, based documents that are, that are there on online rights. Could you, could you answer that, Anuka, please? Yes, uh, I'm so glad to this questions because it's a, La, as a Lavia campus, now we are bringing this uh, campaign last 17 years for until the UN uh, body. This is a, we are so glad to listen about the person right declaration. They're using, a, it's, it's like, a, we call it's like a LVC baby. Uh, we bring this uh, 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 campaign. We, we really need to, this implementation in the uh, UN, UN body to the national level. We're trying to lobbying our government also in Sri Lanka, uh, bring this uh, declaration uh, in, to, in Sri Lanka. Um, we are so glad to listen about the year and how. 
Yeah. The the same question was asked for Jason and and Pamela. Uh, I think Pamela is not with us right now. Uh, I don't know, Jason, if you you can say a word on uh, on the UN uh, official documents. Um. I'm not certain whether the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants has or has not been uh, used on work uh, in Myanmar, but for, uh, for issues that involve international actors, um, including um, UN related organizations, um, certainly um, UN uh, standards and, and rights are being used, different various ones have been used to try to advocate for changes or cancellations of, of projects um, that, that would violate those. Thank you, Jason. There's a, as you, you're speaking, there's also a question from Sabrina Jacobs at KPFA in Berkeley. The question is, given the militaristic rule in effect at this time in Myanmar and the outright denial of any wrongdoing by the military, by Aung San Suu Kyi, do you think there's any chance that the Rohingya people will be able to recover the land? If so, when? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a very difficult um, question. I, I think um, in the very immediate term, um, this would be this would be incredibly challenging. But of course, um, you know, there's perhaps a million people um, who would like um, potentially to be able to do that. So uh, there's a lot of work being done to try to make that possible at some point. Um, in the future. I don't know when it would be possible. Um, it's also important to recognize um, that the direct um, you know, committers of these atrocities were, were the military, but the civilian government um, also has a role in a lot of the human rights violations taking place um, in relationship to land. Um, during 2017, during the height of the military uh, attacks and violations against the Rohingya, uh, the civilian minister, um, not military, but civilian, who uh, also had been appointed to oversee the implementation of recommendations made by uh, a commission headed by Kofi Annan on issues um, in that part of the country. Um, while while that, um, those atrocities were ongoing, he publicly said that under the disaster management law, land that was burned down, and in this case it was burnt, these are homes and farms that are burned down by the military, um, would be considered uh, now state-owned land because it was destroyed by fire. Um, so th there's a lot to overcome, um, not least of all the, the attitudes of, of leadership um, at, at different levels in the country. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, there's another question about the, the MCC uh, whether there are examples of how the, the, the medium challenge corporation, this US government entity, has led to dispossession uh, in other continents and in Africa. I don't know, Anouk, I, if it is something you've been looking at, what has been happening in different, uh, in other countries and other continents. Uh, we touch upon it, so I can say a word on that too, if not, uh, as we touch upon it in the, in the report. But Anouk, if you, if you have anything to, to say on that. I think, uh... I didn't have more information about that, but uh, I can say like a uh, lot of African countries uh, signing this uh, MCC compact, like uh, 2004, it's Madagascar and Nicaragua, Benin, Ghana, Mali, Lithuania, Mozambique, and Burkina Faso. Uh, they these countries already uh, signed the MCC agreement and. Uh, a lot of cases, Ghana is mainly focus of the same kind of project like the land reforms uh, and uh, yes, uh, uh, and uh, they have a different type of uh, project for the different type of countries. Like some countries, uh, they providing for the transportation and some countries for the uh, uh, hydro technologies project like uh, hydropower. This and uh, and also uh, Nepal already have a some uh, 2007 uh, 17 maybe they are going to uh, sign the they sign the MCC and already they trying to re assign or something in the Nepal. Uh, this is a few details, uh, but you can read more details 
in the MCC. I think I can share some article through the African region, what happened in the African region in here. I send the link in the chat. Thank you. Well, Frederick is reconnecting. I see a comment also about the special rapporteurs. Um, so I, I can respond to that, which is um, specific for, for Myanmar. There's been con a country specific special rapporteur on the human rights situation uh, in Myanmar since the early 90s, successively, a number of them. And on the issue in the, uh, in the report, uh, the VFE law amendment, uh, there was a communication by collectively by seven different special rapporteurs uh, to the government, um, raising a number of concerns and asking uh, a series of different uh, rights related questions. Um, and the government has not uh, officially responded to that communication um, by the rapporteurs. You can find that uh, letter on the UN website. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Yeah, my uh, my screen froze and I, I got disconnected for for a minute. Uh, hope you you can hear me now. There was um, uh, thank you, Anuka, for responding on the on the MCC. In the report, we do mention, uh, and I think you you shared the link, Anuka, the the grain report. The, there are a number of instances in Africa where uh, there are serious concerns over the MCC programs. Uh, lending to dispossession around the continent. And overall, what we see, whether it is blockchain in Zambia and in elsewhere, whether it is this, um, uh, this MCC compact about digitizing land records, the, um, we, we see that there's, and this is very well shown in all the case studies, that we see that there's a move really to, to, to shift uh, land tenure from systems which are mostly public land, customary land, into private titles and private, uh, private land. And uh, uh, our understanding is also that after the 2008 food crisis, when we've seen the, this wave of land grabbing around the world, number of countries, some of the Western governments were supporting this uh, move to invest in the global south. A number of corporations have realized that, and this is what the World Bank says actually, uh, uh, very explicitly, the unclear land governance in many countries you know, is an obstacle to, to, to investment. And we see now this move to, to move towards private title so that uh, the, this constraint can be removed. Privatized land can be leased, can be uh, can be sold. Creation of land market should uh, should allow corporations and banks to invest in land and put money in land and natural resources. And this is really the trend and, and what is what is behind what we um, uh, what we uh, what we see around the what we see around the world. Uh, there's another question from uh, Sabrina Jacobs to all panelists. Uh, uh, how effective is the UN system in uh, regards to all of these land thefts and the atrocities that go along? What is, I mean, what are the United Nations doing? What is the power of the United Nations in these circumstances? I, I don't know. Uh, I know, Jason, you've said a word on that. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add or Anuka, if you want to say something. Yes. Anuka, you, you did you want to say more on the on the United Nations? No. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Anika. Uh, Patrick, I didn't uh, okay. get your sound is clearly. 
Okay, sorry about that. No, so there was another question, follow-up question on the UN and the, whether the United Nations could play any role in addressing the, the, the land theft and the reforms that, uh, that are happening in, uh, in Sri Lanka at the moment. Do you believe the United Nations are in a position to, to do something about it? Uh, not way? yet. I can't say like that. It's a, you are not a, have a very concern, but uh, we have a, a sign. Uh, not yet. They are not uh, really involved with the internal issues in Sri Lanka. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know, Jason, if there was anything you wanted to add on the on the United Nations? Uh, well, I, th I think it's also a big question and the United Nations, there's, there's many different agencies and parts of the United Nations, so um, they have their own purposes and don't all act the same way. And um, I think the human rights focus branches uh, of the UN are working to try to raise attention um, to these issues and have been um, making public statements and communications to the government um, and investigations and things like that. Um, and uh, there's other parts that um, have been, you know, focused on, you know, other ways to approach these issues. So it's, I, I think it's it's sort of hard to address the, the UN as a whole in terms of of how it, how it how it deals with this in in any one country or or globally. Yes, thank you. And the I think there's there's also there are also concerns. We we certainly have a, a key role played by the UN special rapporteurs who are trying hard to raise the issues with governments and, and with international institutions. And we, we've seen a number of them really speaking out towards uh, a different uh, a different path for food agriculture, for development, for land tenure, and for the what's happening with the indigenous uh, people as well as uh, we, we see the, the threats everywhere at the same time. Uh, we, we do also, talking about the United Nations, we do also see uh, big threats coming from there. And some of you in the audience may be aware with uh, the, the, the letter we've sent recently to the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, about the, the, the food system summit that the, the United Nations is planning to hold next year in 2021, which is uh, which is going to be led by AGRA, which is an organization uh, created by uh, the Gates Foundation and Rockefeller, which is really about large-scale agriculture, about this privatization of development and this uh, this uh, this very similar vision, and so we we do see. Uh, uh, the United Nations at the highest level under the influence of corporations and these very powerful uh, foundations, which really raise serious concerns for us. So we have uh, very large, very wide mobilization within the civil society around the world to tell the United Nations that this is not the role they should be playing. They should be on the side of the people, supporting farmers, indigenous people, supporting citizens, and not sitting with corporations to, to organize this uh, theft of uh, land and resources and this uh, continued over-exploitation of all land and natural resources while we, while we see our planet burning and, uh, and so much destruction around us. Uh, there, there's another question which is, uh, I don't know if you, any of you can address that is, what do, what do you think of the land value taxation, uh, socializing the market rent potential of location as a strategy for countering the economic aspect of dispossession? It might be a bit technical. I don't know if you have any, any thought on that. The, the land value taxation. Jason, are you familiar with that? I 
probably not the best person to answer this question, but I, I from you know what I know from within Myanmar, I, I, I would say that um, taxation is a huge challenge in, in the country, and there's a low tax base, and also uh, the way revenues are spent by the government is still hugely problematic in that social services um, get a, a very low share of that. Um, and so I think the people who are directly affected by land seizures, um, that would not be offset by resources coming from, from the government, even if the government were to get some incremental uh, increase in taxes. Um, that when people lose their ability to use their land, um, they really struggle to support their families. Um, and and it, it's just heartbreaking. Um, and may, you know, have to become day laborers or, or find some way to, to just survive. Um, and there, isn't, there aren't resources going into any type of safety nets for them, let alone sufficient education, healthcare spending to begin with. Um, but there is a lot of money going to buying new you know, war machines. Um, so I, I'm not sure that increasing uh, tax revenue by, a, by a, probably a small amount is, is going to solve this problem for the people who are, who are directly affected. Thank you. Thank you. Another question on the U.S. pension funds. I don't know if any of you uh, know of U.S. investors in, uh, in the countries you've been, uh, you've been looking at. Otherwise, I can't say a word in general about that. Anuka, do you have anything on, uh, on uh, U.S. investors, U.S. pension funds? If, if not, I will say, so the question is, uh, the U.S. pension funds are invested in agricultural land now. Can you address that? Uh, yes, definitely. The U.S. pension funds, uh, number of, I mean, and not only the U.S. pension funds, the U.S., uh, I mean, all the uh, big universities, Harvard and others, have endowment, endowment funds that are invested in natural resources more and more. And so pension funds, endowments, all kind of private equity funds are invested and looking for more investment in, uh, in agricultural lands and natural resources. So we, we really have to, to, to relate this to, to the, 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 the trends and patterns that have been described because it is not, uh, I mean, we, you might have some corrupt uh, leaders or generals who have an interest in, a, in a Myanmar or another country for developing their own business, but you do have also uh, a very powerful pressure from, uh, from this, uh, funds from the countries which are hosting these funds or which are uh, which are related to them uh, to, uh, to to press countries to have more investment in agricultural land and natural resources and what we are describing with uh, this trend of land privatization to increase transaction land transactions as MCC wants to do in Sri Lanka is really about offering new investment vehicles for these funds. And it's very clear, you, you see very clearly the demand comes from there. It doesn't, it's not necessarily a bad agribusiness company or a greedy investor. It's, it's a world system coming here, looking for, uh, for really the commodification of land and natural resources because they, they are seeking uh, places to invest, uh, to invest their funds. We hear a lot about pine oil. It's not that pine oil is expanding because it's, it's, uh, it's cheap and, and uh, effective. Pine oil is expanding because it's highly profitable. So there's so much uh, financial resources invested into pine oil around the, the world. All the giant pine oil companies are on stock markets and get, uh, get their investors very high level of dividends. And this is why the, this expansion is, is happening. Uh, we are getting towards the, the end of our, of, our, uh, of our webinar, so I wanted to ask Anuka and Jason again if they have anything they wanted to add or share uh, around uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Myanmar, respectively. I, I think Pamela has 
not been able to to continue with us. She, I know she's watching from home, but uh, uh, she won't be able to to participate in person. But for the two of you, is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, Jason? Well, thank you again um, to Oakland Institute and and uh, other panelists and everyone for uh, participating and attending. Um, in addition to the report, I, I again recommend folks look at the blog post on, on the website about the other uh, land reforms. Um, and, uh, and one of the graphics in my presentation um, came from a really great um, civil society network called Land in Our Hands. Um, if you want to look at their website, it's lioh.org. Um, so I, I would also recommend that highly um, if you want to hear directly from civil society organizations in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Anuka? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I want to mention about the, now also we had a lot of issues in Sri Lanka, government trying to uh, clear a lot of forest land in here. They're trying to uh, re, uh, amend a lot of uh, act in here. Still in Sri Lanka, every day, like a uh, hundred, hectares destroyed by the government in the forest land now it's not like only mcc agreement we have uh, so many infrastructure modeling the china involved and the lot of other countries also involved in the sri lanka because of the geo location but still uh, as a people we are struggling with the government for get our sovereignty in here thank you Thank you so much, Anuka. And yes, um, very, uh, very energizing and encouraging to see that you're standing and, and struggling. And uh, I really wish you and we wish you all the best for this uh, for this struggle. And uh, we know you've played already a very important role in uh, in uh, letting the government know that you you don't agree with uh, with these plans and uh, you'll stay uh, strong and uh, safe and be able to continue to do that and and thanks again uh, Jason too the you you mentioned the blog uh, we we had this report but you can see also on the Oakland Institute website there are a number of blogs that have uh, that have actually uh, uh, deepen the, the analysis on, on these countries and we have one on Myanmar one on Sri Lanka uh, one on blockchain as well, so you can find more information there. And and we discovered actually while uh, writing this report and publishing this report that that more laws, as Anuka just said, more laws are being uh, written. Some about land tenure, but then there are some about environment and the forest uh, management. So you have a diversity of laws that are being used to be I mean, either reform or change or amended or new laws that are passed that are all going in the same directions of uh, unlocking as i said in quotation marks the the land and natural resources so there can be more uh, so-called development and it is really scary at the time again the planet is burning at, I mean, is burning at the time so much is happening around us that instead of acting our governments are doubling down and putting more land and resources into exploitation at the time we should do uh, we should do really a, a complete reversal in the way we approach our economic development as a, as humanity uh, so thank you uh, for the two of you thank you for pamela who is listening to us uh, take this opportunity also to, to thank all our supporters and donors for making this event and our work possible and uh, this is uh, the report we've produced was uh, nearly two years in the making i know a number of you are listening to us today so i hope uh, this was uh, interesting and, and useful for for you despite the despite the, some of the techno technological challenges we had uh, thank you so much to my colleague Andy Curier for coordinating the, the organization of the event. Um, uh, again, it's not easy in these times with, uh, with uh, all the constraints and the, the, the COVID plus the fires in our part of the world to organize events like this. So thank you, Andy. And of course, thanks a lot for all of you who decided to join us today for your interest 
and concerns in these issues. We have um, so much to do to mobilize, to stop the overexploitation and the destruction of this planet. Uh, we, we hope this webinar was informative and uh, energizing and encouraging. We, this is what we, what we feel in our work. We, we don't get depressed by what we, we see and hear, but really get from this the energy to, to mobilize and stand and stand with uh, the, the communities we have heard of this um, and today at this webinar and the organizations and individuals who are, who are standing so, so often bravely and taking, uh, taking risks for, the, for their own life. So uh, thank you everyone. Uh, we're gonna end this webinar now. It will be available on our Facebook page and on our website. Uh, today or tomorrow, but uh, would be um, we had some problems with Facebook at the beginning, so we'll make a new video available with the whole recording. And uh, and thank you. Be best wishes and uh, stay safe, everyone. Uh, thanks again, and come again for the next uh, webinar of the Ukraine Institute. Bye bye.